So we're gonna cover things to do, how to get there, how to get around, where to stay, where to eat, all this stuff that you have questions about as you're planning your trip to the Grand Canyon. Welcome. The Grand Canyon is maybe one of the most common bucket list items you'll ever hear someone say. Everyone wants to see the Grand Canyon at least once. So I want to tell you thank you for watching our video and letting us talk to you about one of our very favorite places in the West. My name's Cheryl and this is Nat and we're in the Rockies. We live in Utah and have our entire life and we started this channel because we wanted to help people that don't live in the West be able to come out and enjoy it like us Westerners do. And so today we are going to talk with you about all the in and outs of planning your trip to the Grand Canyon. Yeah, welcome to our backyard. Come chill with us for a little while and <laughs> you might see a few kids run through the camera at some point. So a lot of people will take notes when we do these videos. But before we talk about that, I need to explain at least what the Grand Canyon is actually because it is so massive that it's broken up into many different parks and national monuments and tribal lands. I mean, it's really big and massive and kind of complicated. And so I just at least want to take a minute here to talk about that real quick. So we typically break the Grand Canyon into four sections. So there's the Grand Canyon South Rim. The South Rim is part of the national park and it's the most visited section of the Grand Canyon. And we are gonna spend this whole video talking about how to visit the South Rim because there are over five million people a year that visit the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. The next section is the North Rim. This is also part of the National Park. This is part of Grand Canyon National Park. And it's only 11 miles away from the South Rim across the canyon but it's four hours to drive to the North Rim from the South Rim. So it's like an entirely different park. And only about 10% of the visitors that go to the Grand Canyon visit the North Rim. It's less crowded. I mean, it's really a nice, relaxed environment. But we've covered the North Rim, things you need to know about the North Rim in another video. Okay, then we'll, we have... And we'll put it in the description so that maybe you can look, watch both of these and decide which one you want to go to. Okay, then we have Grand Canyon West. Grand Canyon West is owned by Native American tribes, actually two of them, the Wallapai tribe and the Havasupai tribe. And the two most, most famous things on that part of the park are the Skywalk. You've probably heard about the Skywalk where you can walk out on this glass bridge out over the canyon and stare down. And they actually charge you a fair amount of money to go do that. You have to pay for parking, you have to pay for the skywalk they force you to buy a meal there or something like that anyway we haven't done that yet but at some point we'll do that that's about two hours away from las vegas the other thing that's kind of famous in grand canyon west is havasu falls and this again is run by the havasu by native americans you need to put in a lottery in order to go there it's a multi-day hiking trip or mule trip in and out of uh, havasu falls so we haven't done that either so that's Grand Canyon West. Grand Canyon East is patchwork collection of national monuments and tribal land over there. So a lot of it's owned by the Navajo Native Americans, the Navajo tribe. Um, but there's some other national monuments over there like Lee's Ferry, Navajo Bridge, which is the bridge that you have to cross over to go from the South Rim over to the North Rim. One of the, the two of the more famous things to do on that side are Antelope Canyon, which is a slot canyon where the sun kind of shines in. It's real famous on Instagram. And then the other thing that's real famous on Instagram is Horseshoe Bend. This is just a bend in the river that uh, there's an overlook there and you go look over the overlook and nobody used to go there. And somehow it exploded over the last three years because of social media. Now everybody goes there and now you have to actually pay to take a, to take a shuttle to get to the viewpoint. So anyway, that's a, a little breakdown and I hopefully that helps because I know that when I was looking at this, the Grand Canyon was it was kind of complicated, really big, really big, and it's really remote, so it takes a long time to just to get there. So, okay, so there you go, there's a little breakdown. So, now let's talk about things to do at the south rim of the Grand Canyon. The rest of this video is pretty much going to be all about the south rim, okay? So, of course, we're going to talk about viewpoints. There are viewpoints all along the south rim, dozens of them, and if you like want to check them all off, that's fine, but let me tell you my favorite ones and why I like them so much. I think the first one that most people go to is Mather Point. It's right by the visitor center. It has a great viewing area. You get to see like the steep drop-offs, very panoramic. And one of the coolest things about Mather, just besides it's how easy it is to go to, is that it, it's like going to the premiere of a movie. 
many people are there for the very first time and so of course the canyon's amazing but it's really fun to people watch and see how excited people are the first time they see the Grand Canyon. That's why Mather is one of my favorite spots, not because I think the view is the best, but because I like experiencing it with other people that are seeing it for the first time. The other one I really like is Desert View, which that's on the Desert View Drive, and you have to drive out there for a while, but Desert View was really cool because I just love water, and I thought that was the best spot to be able to see the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River. And my last favorite one was Grand View, which was also on Desert View Drive. And I just thought that was the most beautiful view of the Grand Canyon. But viewpoints everywhere, whether you drive to them, whether you take the shuttles. Powell, if you take a shuttle out to Hermit's Rest, so there's the Hermit's Rest viewpoint. And that has a little, a little building there, a little gift shop that's built to make it look like it was it was made by a hermit. It actually wasn't, but that's kind of a cool stuff. That's almost a must do. And then Powell Point is on that road as well. And that, again, you kind of get some interesting views of the Colorado River from there. And they have a little monument to John Wesley Powell, who was the first one to successfully explore the Grand Canyon. So there's two more. Okay. And there's really not a bad view of the Grand Canyon. So that's our first thing to do is, of course, look into the Grand Canyon. And we know that most people, when they go visit the Grand Canyon, the average visitor spends a couple hours there and then is out of there. And and that's yeah, all so they you... see is a viewpoint. But but Matt's been working on a guide that, like, if you only have one day, you really ought to check out his one-day guide because it'll you'll leave the Grand Canyon feeling like you properly did the Grand Canyon. And that's mm -hmm. on our website. We're in the Rockies.com. But besides the, the viewpoints, let's talk about a few other things to do because we'll talk a little bit later about how long we think you should stay there, but let's talk about some of the other things they have to offer. The next one is the village. The Grand Canyon South Rim is actually not that big of an area. It's less than 15 square miles, the whole village area. So very, very easy to get around. You're not talking Yellowstone, which is the size of two states put together, but the Grand Canyon's small and that's nice, at least the South Rim is. Well, yeah. the roads extend for 30 plus miles from the village, but uh -huh. the, the central village area, oh yeah, really nice and easy to get around. Yes. The South Rim has some amazing architecture, and I'm not an architect savvy person, but even someone like me can appreciate it. There's, They've done a lot to, to honor the Puebloan ancestors that live here, that had lived there, the, the cultures. and to make those buildings look like that. And then there's also a tip of their hat to a lot of European places. It's really kind of a nice complimentary mixture of styles that's really fun to view. And there's great eating at the Grand Canyon. I think, I always think of the Grand Canyon as being desolate and I was all concerned. I was hoarding my food and bringing food into the park. And then when I got there, I'm like, there's food and water everywhere, hooray. It was great. <laughs> but the village really is neat and lots of little tiny museums and visitor centers throughout that, that village. So I've actually made a walking tour of the Grand Canyon Village for you. Uh, the guide that Cheryl was talking about, that, that's included in that guide. The village is cool, we like the village a lot. And we think that's a major part of your visit to the Grand Canyon. Okay, there's, then I would say there's activities. You really do want to vary it up a bit. So there's plenty of activities to do around there. There's a lot going on there actually. So you can hike into the canyon. There's, there's five major hikes on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. One of them is the rim trail that just goes along the top that's paved, flat, and easy. It's about anybody can do that one. And I, then, was, and I was gonna, just going to throw out the Grand Canyon is one of the most pet friendly national parks I've ever seen. On those trails along the rim, I saw plenty of dogs mm -hmm. on their leashes. Um, you know, you would never see that at Grand Teton or Yellowstone. Yeah, now pets are not allowed below the rim. So I mentioned there's five hikes. One of them goes along the rim. The other four go into the canyon. And you can't take your pet on those. And those are pretty intense hikes. It's steep. Okay, the Grand Canyon literally is this plateau that just drops straight down, sheer drop. It's crazy, actually. It's just unbelievable. And uh, so if you're going to hike down in there, be prepared. It's going to be pretty intense. I've done another video on all these hikes and how to prepare for it. So we'll put that in the description. But just know there are two main popular hikes, which is the South Kaibab Trail and the Bright Angel Trail. The Bright Angel Trail is actually a little more popular because it's located right by the village. So you can hike down there. Now those two trails go all the way to the bottom of the canyon, to the river, the Colorado River. But do not plan on hiking to the bottom of the canyon and then back up. 
you, it's recommended really only to go about a mile and a half down and then uh, and then a mile and then back up a mile and a half so about a three mile round trip hike and it really is crazy I you know we live by Zion and we always think about Zion as being the dangerous park and the adventurous park but as we've researched these places the Grand Canyon has way more people that have to be rescued and it's because of that that inverted hiking you know normally you're hiking up a hill and then it gets too tough you just walk down but at the Grand Canyon you get tired and all of a sudden you have a really difficult hike up that's steep and hot and so yes the Grand Canyon I still think I'm trying to convince Matt to make a video about rescues and death at the Grand Canyon but I, I don't know if I can get him to do it maybe put in the comments say yes Matt make that video if you want to hear about death in the Grand Canyon, I'll be happy to make a video about that. So there's about 11 people per year that die in the Grand Canyon, uh, and there have been some really um, kind of crazy stories that have happened. Um, so the, the canyon itself is about a mile deep. So from the, the top rim all the way down to the Colorado River, it's about a mile deep. But to hike down to the bottom of the canyon is like seven miles or something like that because you have switchbacks and, uh, and all that. So uh, again, to go a mile and a half down and a mile and a half up, it's a pretty good workout. And uh, so they don't recommend doing much more than that. Plus, it gets much hotter as you go into the canyon. So the farther down you go, it's like it's four degrees for every thousand feet. Yeah. So, so you could so be the, dealing is, with a twenty degree temperature change. Overheating and dehydration are actually one of the main causes of people dying in the canyon because they underestimate it. Okay, enough about hiking and death. <laughs> Let's talk about biking. So this is another popular activity to do at the Grand Canyon. So the top level, that plateau area, the village, the whole top of the top rim of the Grand Canyon is a very forested area. This is over 7,000 feet high. You wouldn't maybe realize that, but that's that's as high as Yellowstone. The Grand Canyon is as high as Yellowstone. Uh, it's lower elevation or lower latitude though, so it's it's not quite as cold or anything like that. But uh, biking is is a great activity to do on the rim because you can bike along the actual rim with the canyon on one side and the plateau on the other side, or and you can go through the forest. And it's safe. It's not like you're biking and going to fall off the edge. No. Of all the deaths, I haven't seen that uh, listed on the, <laughs> <laughs> the deaths in the Great Canyon yet. So, uh, no, biking is a great activity. And then also mule rides. Oh, but can I say, it's easy to run a bike at the Grand Canyon. Oh, yes. They have Bright Angel Cycles, or I might be saying the name a little right. wrong. Yeah, Bright Angel cycling, cycling or something like that. Yeah, it's right by the visitor center, and there's a few huge parking lots right there, so it's not going to be difficult for you to track down a bike. And they have all sorts of add-ons like, you know, tag-alongs, carts for your baby. You know, regardless of what stage your family's in, you should be able to get hooked up there with something. And yeah. and there are a lot of families around there enjoying that. And and I do want to say as as parents of you know our kids age and our our kids range in ages of eight to fifteen, they do appreciate the Grand Canyon, and then they want to do something else. Yeah. And so you definitely want to mix in some activities. So a bike ride is cool. And then yeah, talk about the mule rides. The mule rides, one of our favorite things we did. Now we did a mule ride on the north rim, not on the south rim, but they have them on both. So on the south rim. The options there are to do a, I believe it's a three hour ride along the rim. Mm -hmm. You can also take a mule ride down all the way to the Colorado River, but this is a, a multi-day, it's a two day thing. You have to put in for a lottery to get it and you have to book that like a year in advance. They do have cancellations though, so you can check on that if, if that's what you're interested in doing. But again, that's, that's a more extreme, kind of a more extreme activity. If you're just visiting the Grand Canyon with your family or whatever, doing a three hour mule ride along the rim awesome well and i was just going to say so we really want you this your trip planning to be a breeze and so we've made several videos on the grand canyon we will put the link to the playlist in the description so if we're talking about an activity we most likely have made a video about that activity so if you want further details and want to see what it's like check out the playlist and that will be super helpful and super fun i think i think really we're so I don't know. I just always thought all there was to do was to look into the Grand Canyon, and now I know there's a lot to do there. And Yeah, there's a lot going on in that South Rim. It's really a fun place. It's kind of a trip back in time, actually, because the next thing I'm going to talk about is the Grand Canyon train. So in the early days of the park, you know, you had to take a train to get there. This was before the automobile, and so they that's why they have a Grand Canyon Village, actually, is because when they brought tourists to the park, they needed a place for these tourists to stay, so they built a bunch of lodges and gift shops and photography studios. 
But then, you know, eventually the automobile, you know, became the, the preferred method of travel and the train went away. Okay, we're having all sorts of technical issues. Apologize here. We have to change the angle here. And you know what, honestly, this is where it's at. It's so shady and comfy. So what I was getting at here was that the, the train went out of business, but then in the 1980s, an investor decided to buy it and to bring it back as a nostalgic thing. And it's worked ever since 1989. This Grand Canyon train has been running from Williams, Arizona, which is about an hour south of the South Rim. And it takes people to the South Rim every day in the morning and then brings them back in the afternoon. And they put on a Wild West show before you go, a, a, like a gunfight. And then they sing cowboy songs and stuff along the way. So uh, obviously a more expensive option, but, but could also be a real fun option for you. So the Grand Canyon train. And I was going to throw my two cents in. I think that the train sounds like an incredible adventure, but if you're trying to check the Grand Canyon off your bucket list, I would not do that option just because the train runs during the day and you'd miss the sunsets and sunrises if that was your only mode of transportation into town. If it's your once in a lifetime trip to the Grand Canyon, stay a little closer to the Grand Canyon. So that's an overview of the things to do there. So let's talk about how to get to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Most people, I believe, would fly into Las Vegas and then would drive four and a half hours to get to the South Rim. So it's really remote. It's crazy how far away the Grand Canyon is from anything. But uh, some people. I was say, we do have something to help you pass the time. Matt made an audio guide all about the Grand Canyon. So if you're making that drive, you gotta check out our website and. and over, over three <laughs> hours, over three hours long stories about the park uh yeah everything you need to know about about the grand canyon some fun stories and stuff some people will fly into phoenix and they'll drive the three and a half hours from phoenix arizona so it's a long ways away from anywhere uh if you're, maybe if you're coming like from texas or something like that you might you might go through albuquerque like bugs bunny you might take a left at albuquerque and then uh and then it would and then you'd be going through like flagstaff arizona so from flagstaff arizona it's an hour and a half way i believe there's connecting flights from phoenix to flagstaff but most people that i've talked to said that it wasn't worth the extra money for that connecting flight to go to all, all the way over flagstaff although flagstaff has plenty of things to do in and of itself that we'll we'll cover a little bit later and one other thing to know about distance four hours either way north or south rim oh yes so from las vegas this is something i was surprised to learn it's four and a half hours either to the south rim or to the north rim so so if you're going to the north rim you're going to go up through st george utah and down to the north rim if you're going to the south rim you're going to go through like on a route 66 kind of a thing you're going to go past the hoover dam and then you'll you'll drive up from williams arizona but four and a half hours to either point so if vegas is your entry point you have really a choice between the two yes and something we learned as we were traveling around this summer and just talking to the people that at our campsite is that many people do Bryce and Zion and the Grand Canyon all in one trip. And if you're wanting to save yourself some driving, go to the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. And because that's closer to Bryce and Zion, you'll do a lot less driving if that's the rim you hit. Maybe give you a little bit more time to actually enjoy those parks instead of driving so much. Definitely our recommendation there. Yes, for sure. Ooh. How to get around? How to get around. Okay, I'm actually gonna talk about this today, which is a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt will, you might not want to follow Cheryl's directions. <laughs> Matt, will, Matt will jump in if I say something wrong. Right. But I can talk about it because getting around the Grand Canyon is easy. That's why I volunteered to talk about it this time. So first of all, going back to it, the South Rim Village isn't that big. It's about 15 miles around there and then you can drive out east and west a little bit longer, but not a big complicated park. And your car is, you can use your car in most areas of the park. Definitely you can drive into the village, the campgrounds. There's a town a little south of it called Tucson. It's about 12 minutes away. You can drive your car from Tucson into the Grand Canyon. So you can, you can drive your car and, and park. It's fine and it's not too rough to drive around there. But they do have a pretty good shuttle system and there are parts of the park that are only, um, that you can only take the shuttle to, like Matt was talking about the hikes. If you want to do that South Kaibab hike, you have to take the red shuttle. Orange the shuttle. The orange shuttle. Yes. Hermit's Rest is the red shuttle. Hermit's Rest. Red yes. Shuttle. Okay. So the Hermit's Rest shuttle goes west. 
Yes. Uh -huh. Goes oh, west. Oh yeah, figuring this out in my mind. Nice. Okay. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Good job. So, so you can you can take the the shuttle, the red shuttle, to Hermit's Rest, and the shuttles are so simple. If you've been to Zion, you might be cringing right now because you're thinking shuttles, and the ones at Zion can get pretty long lines. But but at the Grand Canyon, so easy. You just show nice. up. And, and you wait, I think the longest I waited for a shuttle was maybe 10 minutes, but usually it was five. And I liked that, that red shuttle because you could just, it stopped at several lookout points. You could just hop on, look over the edge, and then hop right back on the next one. And it was, it was just the perfect amount of time between like, it gave you time to look at it. And then 15 minutes later, the shuttle's there and you were ready to get back on. There's a blue one that services the whole village area. So if you're not wanting to drive your car actually into the village, the blue one will come around. And then lastly, there's the purple shuttle and that one will go, that one will go down to Tucson and some of the places further away. And so they're, you know, they're doing their part to mitigate the congestion at the village. But I have to be honest, I feel like the Grand Canyon is, you know, it's not huge, but it's big enough that you could go there in the middle of summer, peak tourist season, and it's really not too bad. Yeah, they talk about how crowded it is, but uh, really not that bad. While we're on the topic though, let's talk about how to enter the park real quick. On the south rim, there are two entries. There's the south entrance and the east entrance. And the east entrance is over by Desert View on the right hand side, or on the east hand side of the, the park. Uh, most people don't enter the east entrance because it's, it's kind of over on the other side. But if you were coming from Flagstaff, if you were staying in Flagstaff, entering in the east entrance, you would have fewer crowds. If you come in the south entrance, if you're arriving after nine o'clock, you're probably gonna have a, a line to get into the park. You have to wait in, in your vehicle in line to get into the park. Before nine o'clock, probably not too bad. And then the last way to get around is just walking. There, There's plenty of walking paths along the rim, in between the buildings, um, and the village is quite condensed, so you can cover a good portion of the village on foot if you're wanting to. Probably do it in maybe a couple miles. It's really not, really not bad. Well, and our guide mixes shuttles and walking, so you know you can you can walk and then catch shuttles and get around, cover quite a bit of ground that way. Yeah, but when we went there, we would just generally park our car and leave it in the same spot for the majority of the day. Mm -hmm. Okay, next thing. Oh, where to stay? I'm going to talk about that too. There are some great hotels to stay in around the South Rim. Uh, many right within the National Park, which is great because then you don't have to deal with the entrance of the park. You're just already in there. And uh, there's Bright Angel Lodge, which is actually, it's actually several small cabins, like over a hundred, I think of these small cabins. They're, they're quite rustic. They are definitely the most budget friendly. They run, they run around a hundred dollars a night, depending on the time of year you visit. One thing to know about lodging within the park. These are some golden nuggets, so be paying really close attention. First of all, you've got to be on top of things with getting your lodging inside the park if you wanna stay at one of the hotels. These book up up to 12 months in advance, like as soon as you, or 13 months actually. That's as, that's as soon as you can book, and some of these places will start filling up 13 months in advance. The other thing to know is that there is no designated hotel parking. There are several parking lots throughout the Grand Canyon Village, but there's not one designated for hotel guests. And so you may be staying at, at the Thunderbird Lodge, but you won't be able to find a parking spot for your car close to it. And so, I mean, just keep that in mind, maybe pack light so that you're not having to do a bunch of to and from trips. And I'd say that's definitely one disadvantage to lodging within the village is that you're not going to get close parking just because you're staying there. Everyone has access to the same parking lots. Okay. The Yavapai Lodge and the Maswick Lodge do have their own larger parking lots though. But they're not right within the village. Like they're a little further away from the rim. Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, everything's close. So don't don't think that they're not great places, but everything is, but yeah, those two have their own parking areas, but all the other ones are on the rim. Uh, the, the, the fancy is El Tavar. That's where the famous El Tavar dining room is. No room is the same at El Tavar. I think it's one of the crown jewel lodges of the national park system. Many people kind of have a dream of staying there. Then they have another couple that are like the Thunderbird Lodge and the- um, Kachina. The Kachina, yes. I'm like, I'm like it's a really cute name. Mm -hmm. But um, the Kachina Lodge, lots of options. But one other thing to know about the lodging is that most of them do not have AC. 
none of them have microwaves. So if you like to do some of your own cooking, just keep that in mind as you're making your travel plans. It's a deal that they have with the Kaibab Forest. And it's high fire danger. Microwaves are kind of a fire hazard. And so none of the inns around there have, have microwaves. And lastly, if you are traveling with a group that's larger than four, um, they don't really have anything for people like for five, six more. You'd want to stay in Tucson, about 12 minutes south for some more of those larger accommodations. Also, where to camp? So there are three campgrounds inside the park at the South Rim. There's Mather Campground, which is over 300 sites. That's the largest. It only costs $18 a night to camp there. We highly recommend camping there. And it's a beautiful campground. So it's beautiful. nice. Elk wander through the campground while you're, while you just, just wander by you. And uh, they'll come drink out of the, uh, the water spigots. The water spigots and all that. <laughs> um, and it's close to everything. Mather Campground's just right there, close to the visitor center and all that stuff. So that's a great one. Near, or right next to Mather Campground is um, the Trailer Village RV, which uh, Mather Campground, if you're RV, if you are using an RV or a trailer or something like that, they only do a 30 foot maximum, I believe. So they're kind of small spots. And no so, hookups. Oh yeah, no hookups. And then, so if you need something bigger, you go to Trailer Village RV, which is, uh, not run by the National Park Service, it's run by Delaware North, a, a concessionaire. So they have their own website. We'll put all these in, in there in the description. But then the other one is the Desert View Campground. So this is located 22 miles east of the village. So this is at the Desert View or the East Entrance, Desert View Watchtower and the Desert View Campground. They're all out there. And so if you want seclusion, then go for the Desert View Campground. If you want to be kind of where the action is, go for Mather. There's also many campgrounds nearby. So actually there are a ton of just kind of private, almost Airbnb like campgrounds nearby, but there is a forest service one just south of the, of the park called 10 X campground. And then there's another trailer village in Tucson, another trailer park in Tucson and a little bit of boondocking there. So, um, yep, there you go, Let, uh, where to camp. So again, we recommend Mather, if you can do it. Yes, we really did love staying in that campground. One of the best national park campgrounds I've ever stayed in. All right, next one, where to eat. Okay, we're gonna keep this quick. We have another video on this, but my recommendation is bring in your own food for breakfast and lunch. The counter service, it's not bad, but it's expensive. It'll take time out of your day. And there is food everywhere, so don't stress about finding something to eat but I just feel like for cost effectiveness and for just making the most of your time, pack your own breakfast and lunch. But we do recommend eating breakfast at the El Tavar dining room. That was such a great little reprieve from the hiking around that we've been doing. And the reason why we say breakfast is because their breakfasts run about $15 a breakfast, which is similar to what the other counter services are in the park. And you don't have to have a reservation. Uh, Dining reservations at El Tavar are highly sought after. Most people have to make a reservation 30 days in advance, but but it's first come first serve for breakfast. So if you get there half an hour before the restaurant opens that day, you can get in and they have some unique dishes like prickly pear syrup and uh, you know, the ingredients are made locally. And so a fun place to eat. And I mean, it was, we kind of chuckled. We don't normally take our kids to fine dining because they're kids, but I could tell they thought they were pretty special being there. It's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And then we loved Fred Harvey Burger for lunch or dinner. The Fred Harvey Burger was really good. Also something we had to get a reservation for. Uh, but if you're looking for a steak, there's the Arizona Steakhouse. And then we did love the Grand Canyon Chocolate Factory in Tucson for carameled apples and gelato. Tucson has many more restaurants and fast food options and like things like Pizza that. Like Pizza Hut and some chains. But I looked up all the reviews on all the restaurants in Tucson. <laughs> and they were not good. The reviews were, were pretty poor on them. So, I mean, feel free to take a chance, whatever. But I would say the food, as opposed to a place like Yellowstone, where the food in the park is not as good as the food outside, Grand Canyon, the food in the park sounds like it's better than the food nearby in Tucson. So I would recommend eating somewhere in the park. And they do, they have a steakhouse and pizza. They have a lot of options. 
And there is a there is a food cart, the Altavar food cart that serves like hot dogs and things like that if you're trying to save some money. Okay, let's talk about when to visit the park. Oh, I put a star there, but I actually wanted you to talk about that. <laughs> okay, so I'll talk about when to visit the park. Uh, at the South Rim, the spring and the fall are typically known as the best times to visit the park. And spring would be March and April. Fall would be like September or October. So again, I mentioned it's really high elevation, so it doesn't really get blazing hot there usually. When we were there, it was in the 90s. It was kind of a heat wave, which is hotter than the average. Um, and then the summer is crowded because that's when most of the people are visiting. So generally they say, you know, spring and fall would be the better times to visit. It's open all year round though. And in the winter, it does get snow, but uh, it's still, still visitable, still hikeable. We haven't been there in the winter, but uh, the ranger we talked to said that February is his very favorite month to visit uh, the Grand Canyon. He says he gets spikes on his shoes and he does just fine. And he says February is kind of a magical time if you're willing to deal with the snow. So um, if you visited, you know, March, April, maybe even May, you'd be missing some of that summer crowd where kids are out of school and all that. So, But it's really not bad. I mean, we went in June and, and even when the, the blue shuttle wasn't running, we didn't have too hard of a time parking our car. Maybe a couple times a little bit, but I would say Grand Canyon handles crowds well. And this was a year when it was supposed to be insane with COVID. And I think probably the numbers are up and it still seemed fine. So most people, I think most people visit the park for a couple of hours and then turn around and go, which I wouldn't recommend doing that. I'd say, you know, get your money's worth and enjoy the place. And there's so much more to do there than just look over and overlook. But, but perhaps that's the reason it didn't feel so crowded. Like even Mather Campground, we were able to get a campground spot there at relatively late notice. So, because apparently a lot of people aren't just staying over the night there. Okay, let's talk about how long to visit the park while we're on it. I guess that's mine as well. <laughs> how long to visit the park? Again, so the rangers told us one of the most common questions they get is, what can I do in an hour and a half? So apparently a lot of people are just stopping by there for an hour or two and going to look at it a couple of lookouts maybe. We would say spend at least one day there where you have, where you, you stay overnight and then you have a full day to see the park and then you stay overnight again. Uh, as opposed to like driving from Las Vegas. I can't imagine somebody driving four and a half hours from Las Vegas and seeing it for an hour and then turning around and going back. But maybe there's people to do that. I, I wouldn't do it and I wouldn't even stay in Williams, Arizona, which is an hour away. I would stay in Tucson or Grand Canyon and I would plan on spending at least one full day. But I think to get even more of the experience, you should probably spend two or at least like a day and a half, maybe do like a mule ride or bike ride the next day or a hike. Try to get into the canyon at least a little bit on those hikes and get some perspective to it. Try to get a feel for the village. Hold well, on. and I think about our trips as kind of an Oreo cookie. You go to a new place to see the new place. Like that's why you go there but you've got to have that frosting in the middle, the, the, the activity, the fun adventure. So take a mule ride, raft the river, bike ride. You know, Arizona is near there. Um, very, very cool drive through wild animal park. So uh, yeah, I completely agree with Matt. I would say one and a half, two days is just perfect because that would allow you two activities which would be pretty fun. And our guide covers all that, what to do in uh, up to three days there actually. Okay, the next thing is what to pack okay. for the Grand Canyon. Yes. All right, so that's always a big concern. What do I bring on this trip? One thing that's really unique about the Grand Canyon is how exposed it is. There's not much shade, and I'm talking even compared to Zion and Bryce. The Grand Canyon is very, very much in the sun. And so even if you're going to Zion and Bryce, you'll see people in their ball caps hiking around. But at at the Grand Canyon, everyone wears the full brimmed hats and it really is helpful to keep that heat off. And many people have like the cloths that they get wet just to keep on the back of their neck to keep them cool. We made a whole packing list about this trip, so I'm not gonna, not gonna go into this a whole lot, but check that out because those things will help you out. You just need a good way to carry your water and plenty of it and ways to keep you shaded in the sun. Definitely water, shade, and then again- And shoes. <laughs> Very good shoes to, to hike in. We say sh we say uh, shoes, not boots. We um, like trail personally, runners. Personally, that's what we like. Yeah. Um, and then some stuff to take in the car because again, it's a long drive to get there. So 
you know, have, and again, we cover all this in our other videos. So, okay, let's talk about what to do on the way to the park. So again, a lot of people are going to, sorry, a lot of people are going to fly into Las Vegas. And so there's a million things to do in Las Vegas. Of course, you can make that part of your trip. On the way from Las Vegas to the Grand Canyon, you're gonna drive by Hoover Dam. This is definitely something you wanna check out. They have tours there, and this is, I think it's the biggest dam in the country. This is crazy, huge dam. <laughs> so much cement. It is amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and then how they built it was amazing, it was crazy. Um, in Williams, Arizona, which is a gateway town, it's, there's a place called Barizona. This is a zoo, Cheryl mentioned this. This is a drive-through zoo with tons of black bears and other animals like bison and even white bison, mountain wolves. goats, wolves. And then in the park, they have a, they also have a walkthrough area. They have three beautiful grizzly bears there, Hannah, Skye, and Crockett. So this is a really, one of the best like bear worlds or zoos I've ever been to. I thought it was fantastic. It was, it was really fun. Just really well lovely. done. They had, and they have nice dining out there like in this big courtyard, they have a band playing. So, you know, it was not the normal stuffy zoo. I think any age could enjoy that. Now, speaking of Williams, Williams is a Route 66 town. So a lot of people like to eat little diners, like little Route 66 diners in Williams. And then even like as you're driving from the Hoover Dam or from Las Vegas over to Williams, Arizona, you can actually go on stretches of the old Route 66 past towns like Peach Springs um, if you want to. So that's something that you can do as well. And then. I mentioned Flagstaff, Arizona. This is about an hour and a half away from the park. This is the largest city that's, that's near the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Flagstaff has a lot going on. They have an arts scene and uh, they, they even have three national monuments. So again, if you're a parky and you want to go visit the national sites, they have Sunset Crater, Walnut Canyon, and one I'm not sure how to pronounce, Wupatki National Monument. Sorry, I'm hashing that. Um, and then there's a nearby place, this is crazy. Sunset Crater was a volcano that blew up. But then there's another place there called Meteor Crater, which is where a meteor hit, which blows me away. You can go see this massive hole in the ground where a meteor hit. And so Flagstaff has a lot of, a lot of cool stuff going on near there. Sedona is kind of by Flagstaff as well. And Sedona is really an outdoor artsy mecca. Really cool red rock and green trees. I mean, remember Sedona, how gorgeous mm -hmm. that was. <laughs> and then I mentioned you could do the Skywalk over at Grand Canyon West on your way there as well. So that is a bit of a detour for you, but it's something that you could do if you wanted to go walk across that, that glass bridge out over the canyon. We're about done, but I wanted to leave you with a few good tips. One is to realize that the sun rises and sets very early at the Grand Canyon. When we were there, the sun rose at 5.30 a.m. and set around 7 o'clock p.m. So plan on your daylight hours. You need to be an early bird if you want to catch a sunrise. And, and we have created a guide for you. We actually have a couple different options of how to visit the Grand Canyon. Whether you're going to do just one day or a couple of days, we've included maps, our favorite places to see the sunrise and sunset. We also include our favorite activities, what we would tell our best friends to do. And so if you want to make your trip planning incredibly simple, you can head to our website and check out our guides. And also included with many of our guides is Matt's amazing audio tours. Matt teaches adjunct history classes for our local university and he's really a good lecturer. I love to listen to his information. I, I always have my tour guide with me, but he has so many amazing stories and his Grand Canyon ones are really good. I'm, I, I'm really excited about these and I, I'm hoping that you'll get to hear them too. But check out our website either way. We also have a lot of articles written about visiting the Grand Canyon if you choose not to purchase a guide. But if you want to make your trip really simple, we encourage you to check this out. We also have one for the North Rim as well. If you're thinking about going there, again, you can watch our video. But we have one for the North Rim, a couple for the South Rim. We include places at Grand Canyon East that you can do, that east side. And then there are so many stories. I mean, the Grand Canyon is history rich. I mean, it really is. Some places I study, there's just not a lot there that have happened. Grand Canyon, there's a lot that's happened at the Grand Canyon. And it just kind of carries this fascination in the, in like our American imagination. People high, walking across a high wire over the canyon, people jumping motorcycles over the canyon. So it is really an interesting place. 
Yes, so we want to tell you thank you for watching our video about the Grand Canyon and we are hoping you get to make it there soon. Take care.